Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 192. On Now You Know. Brought to you, as always, by our wonderful Patreon patrons who help support this show, and they get some pretty awesome perks as well. If you don't know what it is, head on over to it right now. The link is down below in the show notes, and you can really help support us. And as Amazon Associates, we earn from qualifying purchases. Another way you can help us out on the show. And we're brought to you by Ecoware.us. Start positive conversations with carbon negative products. So on May the 4th, be with you, Elon and his girlfriend Grimes had a baby boy named... A X what a you can't pronounce E A twelve. It's um what you don't know how to pronounce that name. Well, I mean, Elon explained on Rogan that the name is X Ash and then A twelve Archangel, which uh, is which is named after his favorite airplane. So it's I mean, are they going to call him Ash? He's cute, by the way. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You really have a lot of options there. You can call him X Ray. Ooh, that's cool. It's an easy one. Uh, you can call him. Now Grimes thinks that it's AI, that the A the A E symbol is pronounced AI, like you know the famous computer oh. thing. But so, it seems like they don't agree on that one. I guess interesting. It'll it'll work itself out. I guess I don't know. I think you could probably call him Kyle. Well, uh, Elon already has a son named Kai, so that would get confusing. Okay, so not Ki- not Kyle. AI is a little too um. Well, I mean, Elon said he's, we should all be afraid of it, so you don't want everyone afraid of a baby. But Elon was on Joe Rogan's podcast again, so this is the second time he was on there. Yeah, this is podcast number 1470, so not the first podcast, the second one. Um, and uh, how many people have watched it? Uh, over 9 million people have watched this interview. It's a wow. two-hour-long podcast with Elon Musk and Joe Rogan. I suggest you watch it. It's a yeah. nice... Uh, Nice two hours. Elon doesn't smoke any weed. I think he handled himself a lot better than he did last time. Not that he did anything like outrageous last time. Right, but there's some controversial subjects in this as well. And I think that Elon went on the show uh, mainly because of the topics we're going to be talking about coming up next, which have to do with reopening his factory. Right. Some of the things that they talked about was uh, Neuralink. It seemed like uh, Joe Rogan hadn't really heard too much about it. And to be fair, most of his audience uh, probably hasn't heard about Neuralink. Right. So that was a very interesting topic. It seemed like uh, Elon was a bit guarded in terms of like not wanting to spill all the beans. I don't think that's what Elon was on the show to talk about. Right. So he wasn't really prepared. And so uh, when it started to get into the discussion about uh, his tweets. Yeah. Uh, that's I think that it was a pretty interesting and nuanced discussion. I like I like this long form format for Elon because a lot of what he's talking about is so complicated that you can't just kind of tweet it out. Like usually when you, I think Twitter was kind of designed for like having a grilled cheese sandwich, right. you know, and then you're like, okay, I guess Bob's having a grilled cheese sandwich. Not like here's a really complicated thing. Wait, uh, but what are your, all of your thoughts on that thing? So one of the first things besides Neuralink that they talked about was Elon saying that he was going to be selling all of his possessions. And it was a really interesting conversation because yeah. Elon was saying that his houses were being used as an attack vector. And if you read between the lines, it's because he really doesn't like his portrayal in the media as this billionaire. And that's kind of because he's not your typical billionaire. A typical no, billionaire has like, you know. Works for like a month out of the year and then they're spends the rest <laughs> of the time like in a bunch of islands. Right, or doing whatever he wants or right. or try, like uh, giving his money away or, do, you know, something else. He's like working every single day right. harder than most people work like at any point in their entire lives. That's true. And so he's he said that basically he doesn't enjoy most of those houses. Like he doesn't spend a lot of time at them. And he bought a lot of them just as buffers because people were breaking onto his property and stuff. Right. Um, and then we did get some Tesla news though. Um, so when first revealed in 2017, Elon said that the Roadster would be coming out in 2020. But Elon hinted on Rogan that the Roadster will be delayed to 2022 as the dessert. So he said first Tesla will be ramping up the Model Y production, then getting Gigafactory Berlin to production, then expanding Gigafactory Shanghai, then getting Tesla Semi to production, then getting Tesla Cybertruck to production, and then would come the Roadster. So that would push it to at least 2022. And Rogan asked if the Cybertruck will come first, and Elon said it would make more sense that way. Right. And I think it does. I think that having the Roadster being dessert is really smart. It's good to have... 
have all the bases covered. You have the sedan, you have the CUV, so the the three and the Y. Then you get the Cybertruck. That's most cars. I mean, I know that there are large SUVs, but I think the Cybertruck fits that role. And if you need something smaller than the Y fits that role and maybe even the X. Once you have all those bases covered and you come out with the Roadster, it's going to get a lot of press. It's going to yeah. have a lot of people talking about it. And a lot of people are going to be interested in buying a Tesla at that point. Um, if they do it too early, people are going to go, oh, that's interesting, but I can't buy a cyber truck. So Tesla's Fremont factory has been closed for seven weeks due to the global pandemic. And in an email to employees on May 7th, Elon said, in light of Governor Newsom's statement earlier today approving manufacturing in California, we will aim to restart production in Fremont tomorrow afternoon. That was last week. I will be on the line personally helping wherever I can. However, if you feel uncomfortable coming back to work at this time, please do not feel obligated to do so. These are difficult times, so thanks very much for working hard to make Tesla successful. So Tesla's HR department wanted 30% of Fremont's 10,000 person workforce to return to begin the plant restart process. But then, not so fast, Alameda County Health Department issued a statement on Friday, quote, Tesla must not reopen. Restoring all daily activities too soon risks a rapid spike in cases and would jeopardize the relative stability we've seen in our health and hospital system. So Tesla Third Row podcast tweeted out, so apparently Alameda County doesn't think Tesla should reopen until June 1st. Ross Gerber said, time for a lawsuit. Elon said, Tesla is filing a lawsuit against Alameda County immediately. The unelected and ignorant interim health officer of Alameda is acting contrary to the governor, the president, our constitutional freedoms, and just plain common sense. So then Tesla owners San Joaquin Valley said, San Joaquin Valley is ready to assist as well. San Joaquin County, right next door to Alameda, has been sensible and reasonable, whereas Alameda has been irrational and detached from reality. Our castings foundry and other faculties in San Joaquin have been working 24-7 this entire time with no ill effects. Same with Giga Nevada. Every day, Elon said, I'm not a lawyer, but can shareholders file a class action lawsuit? In nine days, Tesla will be the last factory of all the car factories to open. We are clearly being disadvantaged. Elon said, Absolutely. Please do. You should be allowed to recoup damages from the county. So then Elon tweeted, frankly, this is the final straw. Tesla will now move its headquarters and future programs to Texas, Nevada immediately. If we even retain Fremont manufacturing activity at all, it will be dependent on how Tesla is treated in the future. Tesla is the last car maker left in California. Then Tesla owner Silicon Valley said, what can our club do to help? Elon said, please voice your disagreement as strongly as possible with Alameda County. Then shortly after that, the mayor of Fremont wrote a letter saying that she supported Tesla reopening. And so now Tesla has posted a blog post with a PR push saying Tesla is the last major car maker remaining in California and the largest manufacturing employer in the state with more than 10,000 employees at our Fremont factory and 20,000 statewide. We understand the impacts COVID has caused and have a responsibility to look out for the livelihoods and safety of our personnel, many of whom rely on us and have been out of work for weeks due to the impacts of shelter in place orders. And then Tesla releases their return to work playbook. What is that? So this is a very comprehensive 38-page document detailing just about every aspect of life at Tesla and how it will be changed due to the global pandemic. Okay, but can you give me some idea of what's in there? I'm not going to read all 38 pages. So one of the reasons a lot of people point to that Tesla shouldn't be going back to work is meatpacking plants across the country where cases have skyrocketed. Now, it's important to realize that it's not just a coincidence that all the meatpacking plants in the country are some of the worst affected uh places due to the global pandemic. Why is that? It has a lot to do with the way they work. Um, meat packing plants have to be cold to keep the meat from spoiling. And as a result, you also have to be blasting in cold air to keep everything nice and cool. And what that means is you have a high airflow in most of the working areas. Uh -huh. And what that does is, you know, usually a, a six foot um, buffer between people is what's considered safe. However, when there's a wind, it's taking particles from your breath. You know, the aerosol that comes out of your mouth when you, when you talk or breathe or sneeze or cough, um, and it whips it away and it could be blowing it directly into someone else's face who mm -hmm. might even be more than six feet away from you. And the cold temperatures mean that the virus can survive longer in those uh, particular places. And now Tesla actually addresses a lot of these points in their return to work playbook. So they have a whole section on HVAC. I'm just going to be pulling out two small points here. Uh, one is to verify all air filters are reviewed and changed to maximum protection and high efficiency to ensure filter change frequency is specified, conducted, and recorded. Hmm. So replacing air filters to make sure that 
you know, the cleanest air is being recirculated into the building. They're also going to be increasing the amount of fresh air from outside that they're pumping into the building. Nice. So you have less recirculation. And they're going to be verifying that fans are working and that airflow is not pointed directly at people's faces. Yeah. And they're going to be providing PPE, including masks and gloves. And Tesla is implementing temperature screenings. So they'll be making sure that all workers coming to work are not sick. And they'll be installing barriers in lunch areas, just like they do in Shanghai, as well as reducing occupancy. They've implemented a standardized response protocol to follow if employees are not feeling well, have been confirmed, or have been exposed to someone with the virus. Um, and that includes exposure tracing. So they would be able to uh, identify people who might be f at a, a higher risk uh, due to a person who is confirmed with the virus. Um, and pretty much all of this stuff is coming directly from the CDC and the World Health Organization. So nothing is too uh, crazy, but they've followed just about every single guideline there is under the sun. And that's exactly what they've been doing over in China is basically all of these things that they've been doing at the Shanghai Gigafactory for quite a while now. And as Elon mentioned on Rogan, they've had no problems at Shanghai. Right. So on Saturday, Tesla filed their lawsuit against Alameda County. And I'm no lawyer, but I read the lawsuit and every single one of the 60 points that the lawsuit raises made sense to me. And to top it all off, Tesla is just asking for the ability to reopen and to void the third county order along with reasonable court costs. They are not asking for damages. So whether or not you believe that Tesla is doing the right thing or not by opening. So what the lawsuit is basically saying is that according to the governor's office, um, and according to the county, the county has also agreed that essential businesses are allowed to open. And initially, it looks like if you read the FAQs, that Tesla would be included in that. And that is why I think Elon thought, OK, we're good to reopen. Because it was, you know, auto suppliers. Auto and, and suppliers, parts. energy, solar, like right. all the stuff that, that Fremont does. Right. And so whether or not you agree, that is basically the, the, the crux of the lawsuit. I mean, there have been lots of other companies that have been opening um, that are not very different from Tesla, and Tesla is going to be implementing a, a very safe standard. Again, this is not something that I think my opinions should weigh on very heavily. I'm not a healthcare professional, nor am I a lawyer. We're just here to report the news. Um, if you want our opinions, you can head over to Patreon and, and, and actually hear them out. But look, we didn't sign up for this. We didn't start a YouTube channel to be reporting on, on you know, a global pandemic. No. We're here to be reporting on uh, climate change and, and the disaster of of what is slowly unfolding in front of us. And unfortunately, this is a major piece of news that it is affecting every single thing that is happening in the news this week, um, along with many of the other weeks. And so we're forced to talk about it. We can't just ignore it. So if you've been following the progress of our Model 3 race car over on our electric performance channel with Blake Fuller, you know that Blake is hard at work getting the Model 3 ready for race day. He's been busy testing and weighing and stripping things out out of the car, but one of the things we need to add into the car is a safety roll cage. Now, as you know, this race car is community sponsored. So far, we have 50 of you with your names on the car showing your support, and we want to spend our funds wisely. So we're reaching out to you, the community, to see if any of you out there in the Florida area has the talent and the interest to help us with the roll cage. Now, I'm going to send it over to Blake to give you a little update. Hey, Zach and Jesse, it's Blake Fuller from Electric Performance. As you can see, I've got my race suit on. There's 90 days until we're gonna be practicing out at Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So in the next 90 days, we have a lot of work to do. We have a roll cage to get. We have to figure out our wheel and tire suspension setup. We have our suspension thanks to BC Racing. We don't yet have wheels and tires. So there's actually an opportunity because of the global health crisis where the sponsors that normally would have happened and normally would have taken up space in the car, we actually have a unique opportunity to allow for additional community support on the new wrap. And you can obviously give them a little sneak peek of what we've got going on with the wrap. Very excited that this is the first ever, to my knowledge, community supported vehicle to race at Pikes Peak. Normally it would be corporate sponsorships or other types of non-endemics. This is an opportunity for the Tesla community the electric enthusiast, the environmentalist, to actually show that we can make a difference by taking an electric vehicle up Pikes Peak, set a record, and really open up some eyes and raise awareness for the performance of electric vehicles. So again, find out more at electricperformance.tv. And Zach and Jesse, thank you for all your help and all you do. And thank you so much to all the community of supporters. We look forward to having your name on the vehicle as we make history at Pikes Peak in 2020. Wow. 
I mean, it finally looks like a real race car because of that wrap. Yeah, I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Shane because he made that wrap possible and a shout out to Dave for making the car possible. And so Blake actually found some more room on the car to fit some more names. Yeah, you see those squares on the back? So, those are available right now. So we've got, I think, less than 50 names left that you can get your name on the car and support us to get the car up the mountain. And if you want to help us with the roll cage in any way, uh, please fill out the Google form down below so we can get in touch with you. So get this, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Tesla last week applied in the UK to get a license to do what? To kill. N no. James Bond. No. I license didn't. to kill. No, I shouldn't. What, I am I, should. am I6? No, I shouldn't. Am I5? No. Da -da 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 I shouldn't have opened it up. Well, wait, wait, wait. It, they got a license to supply electricity. Oh. This is according to The Telegraph. So this may be to introduce Tesla's Auto Bidder program, which is a software platform for automated energy trading. And as we've reported previously, is currently being used at the Hornsdale Power Reserve in South Australia. Interesting. But now, not I, as cool as License to Kill. It is as cool. You just, you, you're you too heavily focused on the killing part. <laughs> um, this is really cool stuff. I think this was supposed to come out after Battery Day. See, Battery Day was supposed to happen in March. Right. And I think... They couldn't put the brakes on it. And so this is telling us what's going to happen on Battery Day, which we're going to tell you more about on Friday. So I know you like spy stories, so you're going to like this next story. This is about a top secret meeting. This is this, uh, this Tesla Time News right up my alley. This is fun. All right. So Daimler, VW, and BMW met at the highest level in top secret meetings to develop a common operating system. How? Why, you may ask. Well, ha wait. No. How? If this is a top secret meeting... Why do we know that they even had it? Well, it leaked. I mean, it, you can't keep having meetings forever without it leaking. It's a terrible, they did a bad job of top secret Maybe stuff. it's been up for a while. Maybe, you know, maybe we just found out. Okay. So you're saying cop, common operating system? Yeah. Why aren't they just using, well, like Linux or something? Well, this is to save money and to pool resources. If each of the car manufacturers had to make their own operating system, which they're not really that good at, uh, it would cost them a lot of money. So VW needs 100,000 EVs by the end of this year to keep from having to pay emissions fines in the EU. VW's ID3 is due out this summer, but it has been plagued with setbacks, especially its OS operating system. The ID3 shells are being produced, but the battery packs in the OS are still not in existence. So they are realizing that they need to compete at making software, which is not their strength. And so they want to join forces. Let me get this straight. So they need to make 100,000 EVs by the end of the year. The ID3 is supposed to come out this summer. In fact, yeah, they just released that the date is June 17th. When was it was supposed to come out? Early. Yeah, but they had software problems. Okay. So they and, gonna, and battery problems. So Daimler, Volkswagen, and BMW are all going to work together on a common operating system. Isn't this gonna be aren't they gonna just be too similar? I don't know. I mean, maybe they can like, make what does different that mean? GUIs. Like why why Well, what? because it's harder than you think to make a GU to make a operating system for a car. Why can Tesla do it so flawlessly? Because they're a software company. They've been doing, this is like their focus. This is what they've been doing. See, these other auto manufacturers, they have engineers who are good at making engines, but not making operating systems. Okay. So is that a good enough spy story for you? No? It's interesting. There's not enough action. <laughs> sure, you want more action. All not right. even like shooty, fun spy stuff action. Just doing things. They're just basically, how can we do less work? So South Korean Hanwha Corporation has signed a deal with Tesla to supply battery formation equipment to Tesla. What is battery formation equipment? They, you, It's how you can line them all up. Well, do they march around? It's the process of initial high voltage and precise current output charging and discharging of battery cells. And it's conducted in the final phase of the battery manufacturing process to format and test before installation. So why would they be getting those machines? Well, the formation equipment will be delivered first to Fremont and then Giga Nevada. So that gives us some hint. Then it'll go to Shanghai and Berlin. Hanwha also produces equipment used for battery cell assembly, such as notching, stacking, tab welding, and pouch forming machines. So this points to the answer, which is that battery production will be taking place at each of the Giga factories. This also points to something that we're going to talk about on Friday to do with battery day. So what, how are people going to hear about this it, this crazy thing on Friday? Well, you could hit the subscribe button and then hit the bell button and it'll remind you to watch in depth on Friday. Oh. So what's this tweet? Jim Bridenstine, who is the head of NASA, said, NASA is excited to work with Tom Cruise on a film aboard the space station. We need popular media to inspire a new generation of engineers and scientists to make NASA's ambitious plans a reality. And then Elon said, 
Should be a lot of fun. Wait, what? So, yeah, this the, the weird thing here is that it's very light on details as to what movie this is going to be or who is going to be making the movie. Mission it's, Impossible International Space Station. It's apparently not going to be a Mission Impossible oh, movie. Okay. Which is, you know, I mean, I, this whole episode, I've just been talking about spy stuff, which is funny because there's nothing related to spy things pretty much at all in the whole news this week. But right. so uh, it's going to be a space movie filmed in space. Let me, can I ask another question? I assume there's going to have to be camera people and lighting crew and audio guys. Well, it's a lot easier to vlog in space than it is to vlog on here on Earth. No, but I mean, you can just put a camera and then you just leave it. You yeah, don't but is he going to need a makeup guy and a script coach and, uh, you know, continuity? You know, Are they going to just fill up the crew <laughs> dragon with, with crew and bring them up there for... I feel like it's going to be like a handful of scenes that they're going to film up in space. Right. And I think that it, they're either going to rely on Tom Cruise because he does all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, But do you think he's going to be in the space station in the movie or do you think he's supposed to be like sitting at home and then like it'll gravity will float him out of bed? Like they'll make a set in the space station. Oh, uh -huh. well, I think it's going to be in space. It would be really stupid if you went to space and filmed a movie that didn't take place in space. I would be really, really upset if they did that. Okay. So I think it's going to be a space movie. The other question I have is Tom Cruise is an older gentleman. He will actually be uh, at about the third oldest person to ever travel into space. Really? Or at least to the International Space Station. Wow. The The record holder is, uh, I think, John Glenn, yeah. 77. Um, Tom Cruise, I don't want to alarm anyone, is 56 years old. 56 is the new 36. Uh, but like for real for Tom Cruise. I don't know. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Not to get too off topic, but uh, I think this is actually really good uh, to have a movie that takes place in space. So, I mean, most people who have been to space are not like the most publicly uh, popular people in the world, you know, well recognized. Like John Glenn was. Right. Like that's maybe the biggest exception to so, this. So, I mean, you think this will bring a lot of popularity back to space? Yeah, I mean, we've had movies that take place in space from Interstellar to Gravity to, uh, you know, the, the the Mars one. They were all... I, I was surprised when we were researching this to hear that there's been other people who have paid money to get to be on the space station as tourists. Like, yeah. some guy paid like $20 million to get to go up there. And I didn't know that was possible. Yeah, there's just a program. You, you go up for about eight days and then you come back down. That's so. cool. Yeah, but like, no one cool has done it. Right. I mean... No one popular has done it. So I think it's going to be neat having Tom Cruise go up there. Uh, there are plenty of other actors that I would have preferred. Like who? Go up there. Like most of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not the biggest Tom Cruise fan. But, you know, great. It's good. It's a good thing. Tesla Time News is sponsored by Cybertruck Owners Club. There you'll find a crowdsourced reservation tracker that you can update. Check out their website for Cybertruck news, discussions, and community for Cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners. So get this, the Lexus UX300e, their first EV, is now on sale in China and will start selling in Europe later this year. Oh, man, China and Europe get the best stuff. Sorry, we got Teslas here. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. But uh, I mean, We're, okay. we're going to have the Cybertruck for they are, so. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Uh, so what's, what's cool about this car? Well, it has an air-cooled battery. That's versus Tesla's liquid-cooled battery, and Lexus is touting this as a feature, even though data suggests that air-cooling a battery is nowhere near as effective as liquid-cooling it. Take a look at this chart here from Geotab, which is a fleet management company that compared the 2015 air-cooled Nissan LEAF with 4.2% annual degradation rate to their battery to the 2015 liquid-cooled Tesla Model S, which had 2.3% degradation to their battery. Wow. Now, Geotab studied 6,300 EVs, so this isn't just a little bit of cherry-picked data. This is pretty good data. So one other aspect of this is kind of uh, LeafGate. Um, you remember this, this happened a little while ago. It's basically people bought their the like new 2015, 2016 Nissan Leafs. Uh, they went to go on a road trip in it, and basically you'd get to the first uh, fast charger, and you'd charge up in 30 minutes, no problem. Then you'd get to the next charger, and the charging rate would be reduced because the battery was still very hot right. and it didn't want to kill itself. So it would limit the charging rate, right. which meant that you had to sit there for an hour and a half just to charge up to get to the next charger. Exactly. 
All right. So, but how much does this thing cost? So the Lexus UX300e sells for $54,000 in China, and the European price is expected to start at $45,000, and it will be coming to Japan in 2021. Lexus is giving a 10-year, 1 million kilometer warranty on the battery. That'll be to a 70% capacity. And uh, it's got a 54 kilowatt hour battery pack for an NEDC range, which I don't even know why they do this anymore, of 400 kilometers or 248 miles. It has 6.6 kilowatts of AC charging and 50 kilowatts of quick DC charging. Interesting. So it sounds like it's a little bit beefier Nissan Leaf. Yeah. Which isn't bad. No. I mean, I'm not, it's a little pricey, especially in China. It's funny that the European price is so much cheaper. Well, I think probably import stuff would have something to do with that. I okay. Know. I mean, good. It's another EV you can buy. Some people might want to buy it. Yeah. All right. I think this is big news. Mm-hmm. Sunrun tweeted last week, big news. Sunrun is helping Americans take control of their home energy. You can now back up your entire home with Tesla Powerwall, ensuring power to your home, office, kitchen, and everything your family needs to stay safe and comfortable during blackouts. So keep in mind that Sunrun is U.S.'s largest solar installer since 2018, having surpassed SolarCity Tesla with 97 megawatts installed last quarter versus Tesla's 35 megawatts. So wait, Sunrun is a competitor to Tesla. You just said that. Yeah. So why are they installing Tesla power walls in people's houses? Well, they used to offer the LG Chem home battery, but Tesla's is cheaper and bigger. So uh, LG Chem's is 9.3 kilowatt hours. Tesla's is 13.5 kilowatt hours. But Tesla's is actually cheaper, even though it's still bigger. So I think what was happening is a lot of Sunrun customers who wanted battery storage were like, okay, can you sell me a battery too? And they're like, sure. And then like, your battery sucks compared to Tesla's. Uh, I'm going to go with Tesla. And they're like, whoa, 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 don't don't leave. <laughs> so this is like if you went to the Apple store and they were selling like Microsoft computers. Well, and that leads into the next story here. Tesla is now offering a price matching policy for its solar panels. Get this, in order to fulfill our promise of providing you with the lowest price solar, Tesla is offering a price match guarantee. Join us in accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy, all while obtaining the lowest price solar panels within a fast and simple installation process. So now if you want solar and you're like, well, I don't know who's got the best or cheapest, go out and get all the bids you want, If you find a bid from a non-Tesla company like Sunrun or Vivint, you just email Tesla right here at energyorder at tesla.com. Use our referral code down below. And Tesla will see if you qualify for price matching. So, I mean, this I think is showing that Tesla wants to get back into panel solar big time. So this is EPA's rebuttal rebuttal. So you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about that um, the EPA had tested a Model S. They found out it had 391 miles of range. Mm -hmm. Elon contested that and said, actually, it has 400 miles of range, but you, EPA, left the door open one night, so you let some battery juice go. Um, And then EPA came back and said, no, that's not true. We were right. Well, here, Elon says in this uh, tweet back to Clean Technica, weird that EPA would deny this. We have precise car logs that confirm it happened. Happy to provide them. It's exciting. I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that Tesla's making, you know, juicy little news stories for us to cover in this time when there's not too much else. What happening. are you talking about? <laughs> you know, like other car companies like uh it's filling in for all the other car companies who are like We're not gonna do any EVs because of uh, it's a global pandemic, so we're gonna stop everything. All right, here's another one that I think is huge news and that we're gonna talk about next Friday. Tesla filed for this patent, cell with a tabless electrode. They filed this in November 2019, and it was published last week. This is a big deal for a bunch of reasons. So uh, what is it exactly? Well, take a look at this picture here. So if you think of a battery like, let's say, a roll of toilet paper, Mm -hmm. um, it's it's laid out flat, and then they roll it into a tube. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're an electron in the very innermost part of that tube, to get out, you have to go, oh, 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 oh. And then all the way out the tab. I see. So at one end of this long sheet that's rolled up is a tab, and that's where all the electricity comes out. Okay. So what does that do if you're that electron? What what, what are you doing to the pack as you're trying to get out? You're swearing? No, you're you're, 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 even if you do it quietly. I mean, you're you're heating up the pack. 
Okay, so you're actually heating up the battery cell yeah. to do that. Okay. To, to get out. But here in this patent, what they've done is they've placed the electrode on a on a band there. If you can see that kind of in the picture, uh, it's that, that strip along the, the band at the bottom. So basically wound into the pack all along it is an electrode where electrons can get out. So the farthest you have to travel is just an inch. Oh, it's just up. Just right. Just or go down. up. Just right. go up an inch or whatever and you're out. So that dramatically lowers the ohmic resistance. Why weren't we doing this to begin with? Nobody thought of it. Are you kidding me? I guess. I don't know. So it's cheaper. There's less parts. There's less work to make it. It's easier to make the pack if you just squash a conductive cap on top. And the ohmic resistance in the negative electrode during the electrochemical cycle can be reduced by 5 to 20 times via embodiments in the present disclosure. That is what innovation looks like. So they just made a better lithium-ion battery. Yeah, and they normally just... the, everyone was like, oh, well, if you make it better in this way, it gets worse in that way. And they found a way to make it better in all ways. Wow. So yeah. this is going... And I'm to... not the only one who thinks this is a big deal. <laughs> Elon said way more important than it sounds. But they just reinvented the battery cell. One of the aspects of it, yeah. And I mean, this could be huge. Huge, dude. We're like... Like, everyone has been talking about solid-state batteries and dry electro... Uh, well, that's huge, also, too. That, all that stuff is huge as well. But basically, using existing technology, they just changed a little thing, which could have a huge difference. Exactly. I just can't believe that no one thought of this before. I think everyone's been so busy just sticking with what works. So CNBC reported that SpaceX's recovery ship Go Searcher rescued a person who had drifted away from their boat when the current separated them from their boat outside of Port Canaveral in Florida. Now, wait a minute. This ship is designed to recover, like, big rockets, like the first stage of, of cargo and crew dragon. Yeah, but it also can save people, which it did. But the guy didn't, like, land on it. No, no, he, he, like, swam up to it and was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Gee, I shouldn't have swam away from my boat. And uh, Elon said, glad we could help. Oh. And I just want to point out, this week is everyone's talking about crazy tweets from Elon. You know, we always report on Elon's tweets, which we'll have later in the show. There's plenty of these tweets where Elon is just being a great person right. and talking about great things that his company has done for mm. people. So last Thursday, Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin announced that almost 20 miles of Seattle streets will be permanently closed to most vehicle traffic by the end of this month. And I want to point out that that doesn't mean there'll be no cars on the street. So residents, delivery drivers, garbage and recycling workers and emergency response vehicles can still continue to use the streets, but no through traffic will be allowed. So, I mean, as we've been going through this like lockdown period, it's nice to get outside and into the fresh air, especially now that spring has sprung. Um, the problem with most sidewalks, though, is that they were not made for social distancing. They were made for like... As little bitty space as you can get, and the rest is just for cars. Um, so essentially what they're doing here is closing down the streets to cars and opening it up to people and bikes. Um, and I think that that's really, really cool. Yeah, as Mayor Durkin said, as we assess how to make the changes that have kept us safe and healthy sustainable for the long term, we must ensure Seattle is rebuilding better than before. Safe and healthy streets are an important tool for families in our neighborhoods to get outside, get some exercise, and enjoy the nice weather. Over the long term, these streets will become treasured assets in our neighborhoods. And it's a really, really neat idea. And this gets to a point to talk about e-mobility mm -hmm. and e-bikes and even like smaller electric vehicles like uh, the Arkhamoto. It could open up this sort of like class two roadway where it's like not open to class one cars, mm -hmm. you know, cars that can like go on a highway and go very fast and stuff like that. But small, extraordinarily like neighborhood cars, yeah, yeah, neighborhood cars, urban cars, these like small, you know, little you know, things that aren't going to, like, go very fast or hurt anyone. Um, you could have extremely strict speed limits, very low, like 10 miles an hour, depending on the class of vehicle you put on there. And I think it could be transformative to a lot of cities. I think it's a really good point. I mean, we have forever put walking and biking last when we plan. And that's because fossil fuels and big auto uh, were the ones that made all the rules, right? And now, with autonomous driving on the horizon, it's time to put these first. Minnesota's Great River Energy will close one of the largest power plants in the upper Midwest, its Coal Creek Power Station in North Dakota in 2022, a few years earlier than planned because it says it is losing too much money even though it's adjacent to a coal mine. So wait, you have a power plant that is run by coal next to a coal mine 
and it's still losing money. Yep. It will be replaced with new wind farms. Great River said its carbon dioxide emissions will fall by 95% from the Minnesota benchmark year of 2005. David Sago, the CEO of Great River, said the real driver for this decision is economics. The drop in emissions is not a driver of closing Coal Creek, but it's a significant side benefit. So they didn't even do it to be green. They did it because it was too expensive to keep it open. Wow. When the transformation is complete, Great River expects that two-thirds of its electricity will come from wind turbines. That's amazing. Win for wind. (laughs) Yes. And this is a record, folks. According to the EIA, for 40 straight days from March 25th through May 3rd, renewables, that's solar, wind, and hydropower, generated more electricity in the U.S. than coal on every single day. So 40 days and 40 nights, the sun doth raineth upon thy solar panels and thy wind doth blew through thy wind turbines and, and doth <laughs> and water doth flow floweth through through thy <laughs> and 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 produced more electricity than coal so this is the first time that this has ever happened yeah put this in perspective in 2008 coal's market share was above 50% but in January of this year, 2020, coal's market share fell below 20% for the first time in decades. And it continued to fall 18.3% in February, 17.3% in March, and only 15.3% in April. Wow. Bye-bye coal. Bye-bye coal. Hello, renewables. That's amazing. So Fiat's brand president, Olivier Francois, said this. This is not a plan B. It is not a current platform that we've tweaked to accommodate some batteries. It's all new, and this little car, once again, is totally relevant. This is our urban Tesla. What is he talking about? He's talking about the 500E. And he said that it's totally relevant? That's not something that you generally want to say about yourself. That it's not. You don't walk around being like, I am the coolest. That is like the we demand to be taken seriously. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, this is what? Well, he also said, the thing we know is that we have a successful nameplate. It is a leader in Europe. People love it. What we don't really know, what we have no visibility on, is future demand for electric vehicles. But we need to be ready. We know that demand for sure will explode because of the regulations in city centers. So he's thinking just because of regulations, uh, people are going to want these EVs, and they're ready. So check it out. It's got a 42-kilowatt-hour battery. It has 199 miles of WLTP range. Again, why use that range calculator? Uh, it can quick charge at 85 kilowatts. has level 2 charging of 11 kilowatts. It has 117-horsepower motor, and it will go on sale in 2021 for 32,000 euro, $35,000. Now, is it coming to the U.S.? No word on that yet. But Olivier did go on to say, You'll have people who are totally new to electric who have never had an electric car, but who are passionate about the design, the coolness, the statement that the 500 makes about who you are. The other aspect will be the fabulous fanatics, who are not necessarily green. It's just people who want the 500, and they are very loyal. They have bought maybe two or three 500s over the past few years, and now if they want the latest new car, they have to go electric as well. I think it will be a mix of conquest and loyalty. But in both cases, our objective is the same, to convert drivers from petrol to electric. It's like having a tree on four wheels. Everyone wants the world to go green, right? But not everybody is ready to trade their beautiful car and fun to drive for an electric appliance. Is this like the first, dra- like, was he in a rush? Were they like, <laughs> oh, Francois, hey, uh, sorry, we uh, totally forgot. But in like uh, five hours, we need you to come up with a complete brand thing for this car. Now, I just want to talk no, about I, the car for a second. I Okay, go for it. It's it's cool. Like, that's sure. great. I love, I love the Fiat 500. Yep. He's completely right that I like it. Um, are you a fanatic? I A lot of the other things that he says are a little just cringy. Like, what, I don't... a tree on wheels? Yeah, <laughs> that's part of it. And also just like... How about this part, though? As you have seen today, Fiat 500 is an activist and an alchemist. So yes, it can. It can turn a cult into a culture. It can turn electric into eclectic, ethics into aesthetics. It can keep inspiring change as it has been doing for more than 60 years and always will. Thank you. And I will see you very soon in Turin. I 
I don't know. It's um, look, he, here's, it's, here's it's the a fine part. car. Like the, here's the thing. I don't know if he's driven a Tesla because for him to make these statements about, but not everybody is ready to trade their beautiful car and fun to drive for an electric appliance. <laughs> right. I mean, what? I, I think that this car is going to be fun to drive. The horsepower is just about right for the size. Uh, the battery's uh, pretty sizable and decent, yeah. and the charging car, charging yeah. rate's pretty good. I mean, you know, it's expensive for an urban car, but like you said, you know, if people are into this brand and into this look, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's good. It's just a, what it's a just, weird marketing. Yeah, like it's, it's very relevant. <laughs> okay. Now, we've all heard about this as a concept, but Skoda has unveiled the camouflaged production version of their Enyaq 4. This is to be built on the VW MEB platform, so it's going to be similar to the ID3. And there are three different options that they're giving here. The entry level with a 52 kilowatt hour battery, 109 kilowatts of power, and a range of up to 340 kilometers. Mid level, which will be 58 kilowatt hour battery, 390 kilometers of range, and the upper, which is 77 kilowatt hour battery, 460 kilometers of range. It'll go zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 6.2 seconds. It'll charge 11 kilowatts and DC fast charge up to 125 kilowatts. So it'll hit Europe late 2020 at a cost of about 40,000 euro, $43,000. So this is basically just another ID3. It's funny, this camouflage thing. Yeah, wh why do they do that? So I think I figured it out. Yeah. In the beginning, I was like, are they're are they trying to hide the car. If you want to hide a car, you just make it look like a car. If you want to get attention, you camouflage it like this it, it's to get the right attention right it's, for most people they're gonna look at this and be like i don't get it for car people they're gonna be like whoa wow like they're not gonna no one's gonna make a, a news publication article about this car if it just looked like a car so the um, camouflage becomes the story the it, camouflage it, is the interesting part it's this like you can't know what it is but like basically here it is you can totally see it in all of its lines and glory and it's I, just I love a how Tesla bit. does it where like with the Cybertruck the camouflage was was an image and you had to figure <laughs> it out like that's true camouflage yeah I mean that was definitely one interesting way and basically everyone was wrong because i mean imagine if tesla had come out with the camouflage cyber truck and like you don't know what it looks <laughs> right, like right <laughs> all right there's been a new tesla over the air update 2020.16 have you gotten it yet I've not gotten it yet but i have gotten the hardware version three congratulations so i finally i put it at and everyone was right. I just had, it, like, I was all complaining and everything. All I had to do was go into my Tesla app and make a service appointment and just ask for the hardware version of 3. Uh, I got delayed a week, but then they installed it. I did the contactless delivery. Well, actually, you know, let's just show it. So welcome to Now You Know. Today we're going to be headed down to Tesla's service center. I'm going to be getting my Hardware 3 uh, computer installed, and I'm going to be getting some new tires put on the car. And today is kind of interesting because I'm going to get contactless service. All right, so we've arrived at the service center and this morning I received a very long text from Tesla explaining how the whole procedure works. It reads uh, like this. Good morning. In following guidelines to minimize interaction, we've implemented a no contact arrival process. Using your phone, please click this link on arrival at the service center. This will notify us that you have in fact dropped off your vehicle. If you need a loaner, please provide us your driver's license number and insurance provider. We will then email you a loaner agreement, which you need to review and accept. Prior to your appointment, please leave your vehicle's key fob slash card in our night drop box and fill out an envelope with your first and last name, as well as the best phone number to reach you. Please disable the pin to drive if you have the feature enabled. Please reply here if you have any questions or use your Tesla app to modify your appointment. Thank you and stay safe. So I'll click on the link which brings me uh, to this where I'm going to fill in my information. Okay, so I filled out my information and I will hit submit. So now I've checked in and apparently someone is going to call me in a few minutes. So I'm going to uh, put my mask on, we're going to go outside and I'm going to uh, find the envelope where I'm going to put in my card. here so I don't have to lick it 
All right. Hello. Yep. Good. All right, so about an hour ago, I got a text from Tesla saying that my car was done. Um, they've locked my key card in the car, which I can obviously unlock with my phone. Um, so I just walk over to my car, just like it was a normal day. My key card is right in there. I didn't have to go in, talk to anybody, do anything. I just am literally walking up to my car and all the work should be done. Oh, and by the way, I should have hardware three. Oh wait, so you got to install it without having to talk to anyone. Yeah, and as a millennial who hates talking to people and social interactions, it was pretty great. I mean, I did have to make a phone call, but other than How that. How was that? Oh. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, yeah, you just put your card in an envelope um, with the little sticker so you don't even have to lick it. Wow. And you pop it right in a the thing. They call you right away. Well, let's see what the new update has in it. So there's new toy box, filtering charging stations, and dash cam improvements. So let's check this out. So the new Tesla toy box has been redesigned to make it easier to view and play. Simply scroll through the toys and adjust the associated controls. As before, to access the Tesla toy box, tap the toy box icon from the application launcher. So that'll be cool. Nearby charging stations. The charging list has been improved to easily filter nearby charging sites based on maximum power. Simply tap the charging icon on the map and filter by selecting the associated lightning bolt icons. And so that's cool. You can see if it's fast charging or not. Yeah. And then lastly, dash cam improvements. Dash cam is now easier to set up or erase. After plugging in a USB drive, tap controls, safety and security, format USB device to format and create the associated folders for dash cam. This That's is, what we've been waiting for. Oh, all the grandchildren of the world rejoice. <laughs> You're not gonna have to explain how to how to do this. Grandma hit backslash. <laughs> now type these words. Capital T. All right, it's time for a video contributor stories. And this section of the show is sponsored by GoPuck. We use GoPuck every day practically when we're filming because it is an awesome battery storage device. Use our GoPuck referral link and discount code in the show notes below. All right, it's time to go geothermal. You know, with the uh, current situation with the double nasty bad cold going around, I found some free time and I decided to do something a little bit eco-friendly. Let me give you an idea of what we're, what we're doing here. This full of tubing is part of a geothermal heating system for my home. This tubing gets buried in the ground and coolant is circulated in the, in the tubing in the ground and it exchanges the, the energy from your home, either heat or cold, into the ground. It's very efficient. All it takes is a shovel and a little bit of time to bury the tubing. And maybe I'll use a little bit bigger shovel. A geothermal heat pump is typically installed in place of a traditional furnace. It's fully electric, so there are advantages to that, especially if you happen to have solar. It uses the energy from the earth with a circulating coolant in the ground, exchanges that energy into your home to either heat it or cool it. Hey, tell them about the advantages. Well, some of the advantages, it's very quiet. It's very efficient. Typically an electric furnace, expensive. But gas, coal, propane, heating oil, wood, those are all fossil fuels. We want to get away, with, away from that. This furnace is all 100% electric. There's no flue pipe, there's no open flame. So it's it's very eco-friendly. It's also... It's very quiet. Yes, it's also very quiet. Ah, uh, is it expensive? No, it's not typically expensive. It's about on par with replacing a traditional furnace. Or you can do it yourself. But the advantages are you have add value to your home and it's you're gonna save a lot of money over time. Typically, a traditional furnace, when you invest a dollar uh, of cost to generate energy, such as heat, you get a dollar's worth of energy, a little bit less if it happens to be natural gas. With a geothermal heat pump, every dollar that you invest to generate energy, whether it be heat or cold, you get four dollars back in effective energy generation. So it pays for itself over time rather quickly. If you're looking to reduce your carbon footprint, you really can't go wrong with geothermal, whether if you're replacing your current unit or if you're building new, geothermal is the way to go. Imagine no heavy utility bill for heating or cooling your house anymore, even less if you use solar. Yeah, nice dance. The future depends on what you do today. Now you know. Back to you, Jack and Zessie. Ah, found him. 
That was awesome. <laughs> that was. If, if any of you can make a video contributor story that is as informative and, and hilarious yeah. as that, uh, that's an A+. Plus. Way to go. And by the way, we're running out of contributor stories. So if you've got some things you want to tell us, it's not that hard. Send them to Zach at NowYouKnowChannel.com. We'll get them on the air. All right, it's time now for Patreon bonus stories. Uh, this is every week. Zach and I have more stories to that than we know what to do with. You yes. may notice that this show is already like an hour long. Um, we have more stuff to talk about, though. There is more interesting stuff happening in the world. Um, Some of it we can't talk about on the show. And we can't show on the show. Right. So we made a special Patreon bonus stories for our Patreons. And I say Patreons because I mean all of them. At $1 a month, you get to view all of the Patreon bonus stories every single month. So that's four Patreon bonus stories. It's about a quarter. It's about 25 cents per Patreon bonus stories. Yeah. So head on over to Patreon. Support us for as little as a buck a month. You'll help support this channel, and you'll get some really great perks as well. Hey, we're back from the Patreon bonus stories. It's time for the Patreon shoutouts. And uh, who do we got this week, Jess? We've got Chuck Tyler. James M. Mark Sayer. Daryl Lipscomb. Simon Wong. Mark Anderson. Greg Marshall. Adam. Kerry Hales. And Kevin Carter. Thank you so much for supporting this show. Got them all right again. Without you, we got it all correct that time. We didn't even, we didn't even flubber. <laughs> Only took 192 episodes. There you go. All right, it's time for Elon's Tweets of the Week, and he did not disappoint. There's a lot of tweets here. Uh, here's one from Tesla owner Silicon Valley. They said, do you think we could get video conferencing within a Tesla? Elon said, yeah, definitely a future feature. Let me just explain what that might look like. There's a little camera that faces you in a Model 3 right. and a Model Y, yeah. and you could, in theory, at a supercharger or whatever, say, hey, hon, i I'm going to be home a little late. Yada, yada, the, yada. The problem is that the screen's down here and the camera's way up there. So that's going to be a bit of a, like, y y if you look up there, then you can't see the people. And if you look down there, then it just looks like you're... Okay. But whatever. Whatever. It It's cool. It's way better than having to, like, pull out your laptop and create a mobile hotspot and do all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Like, it's that's awesome. Elon said on May 3rd, SN4 lights up soon. Raptor looks so small. Starship SN4 passed its static fire test. Take a look at that. Um, and what's wild is that the Super Heavy will have 31 Raptor engines in the same space. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be pretty wild. Viv said, didn't you also used to fly old Russian fighter jets for fun about a decade ago? Elon said, yeah, but stop doing physically risky things after the kids were born. <laughs> Thanks, Elon. <laughs> Thank you for stop doing risky things. That's nice. Then this one from Michael Hodges, who said, 18 years ago today, a company that has changed the entire landscape of how we will access space was founded. In just that time, they delivered cargo to space station, put a Tesla into space, landed reused orbital boosters, landed reused capsules, launched satellites, just to name a few. Elon said, that was the whole company back then. Grew organically from a simple mariachi party in El Segundo. <laughs> Where's the mariachi band that was in that? Do you think they're still playing? I mean, do you think they were like, oh, we have to do the startup today. They're not going to last. <laughs> did, did, like, I would keep inviting them back every year. Yeah. Don't you think? Um, and then Third Row Tesla Podcast said, what's the next full self-driving feature we're going to get? Automatic lane changes on city streets? And Elon said, turns on city street intersections is the big one. Viv said, what about roundabouts? And Elon said, roundabouts, no problem. But dodging distracted human drivers, very tricky. As a human driver, I can attest to that one. The Tesla owner, Silicon Valley, said, can we get miles in range to show up on the app and in the car? And Elon said, probably makes sense to have a details section of the app that mirrors everything in the car. Would also allow phone to be used in lieu of car screen if car screen faults for any reason. Tesla Tino said, Elon, remind us again, what are the projected upload and download speeds for Starlink? Consumer and commercial levels, if you will. I do a lot of remote work, so a reliable, stable, and fast connection is a must-have. Not just for the occasional. I currently have fiber internet with an average of 900 megabits per second up and down streams, but half of it would suffice. Elon said, Peak rate of about half that for version 1 is about right, but heavily dependent on users per cell. Aiming for latency under 20 milliseconds. So those are some pretty respectable speeds. For, for level one, exactly. I mean, uh, look out, 
basically every internet service provider in the country. Viv tweeted out a quote that Elon had said on Rogan. We should have fewer people doing law and finance and more people making stuff. Elon said, to be clear, I do think finance and law are important, but too many smart people in the U.S. go into those fields. Also, too many MBAs. Steven Spencer said, you think there would be more top-notch engineers if there were less law finance people? And Elon said, it's not all about engineering, although that is my personal favorite. Striving to make products or provide services in excess of what you consume is the noble goal. So again, for people out there who are saying that Elon's crazy and he only tweets out stuff like the stock price is too high, <laughs> this is the other stuff he's doing all right. week. Third Row Tesla podcast said, can you add a section in the odometer to show how many miles the car has driven on autopilot? Elon said, okay. And then Kristen said, could a Tesla technically sense a baby left in a car seat? Give a warning. Elon said, Teslas automatically maintain their internal temperature to within safe limits in case a pet or child is left in the car. Jonah said, could a Tesla sense when a driver is in distress, like if they black out? That happened to a friend of mine today. She was on a heavy mix of heart meds, and she passed out behind the wheel. She's fine, but her van is messed up. Elon said, operating on a prime directive of crash avoidance, it could automatically intervene when crash probability is approaching 100%. And then Ivan said, can we also get side view cameras on the main screen when we use a blinker? And Elon said, that's harder than it sounds. We'll check with team. That actually was the one that sounded the easiest. I know, right? <laughs> then Third Row Tesla Podcast said, Elon, a bunch of Tesla drivers outside California complained to me that some of their speed limits and map data on exit lanes, etc., aren't always accurate, and it's a pain in the ass for them. Works well here in California. Plans to improve map data or read speed limit signs? Elon said yes is a high priority. And wow, like, amazing. Everyday Astronaut said, why can't the camera read the speed limit signs? Is it because of the patent from Mobileye? It seems like that's not a very novel thing and wise for the future of self-driving cars. Elon said, coming soon. So there you have it, folks. He's a busy guy on Twitter. Yeah. All right, it's time for Community Mail Time. Community Mail Time. So we have our friend Will in Australia who actually visited the Hornsdale Battery, the one that we talk about so no, much. No, we didn't. So we have some pictures and some video. Um, he said, hi, Zach and Jesse. I was recently at the Tesla Big Battery in Hornsdale, South Australia, and made a short video of the new extension. Regards, Will. Thank you so much, Will. This wow. is super freaking fun. That's so nice. What is this? So David actually uh, designed this. It's a it's a Tesla charge-in concept. So it's like a drive-in, only better. Wait, so you get charged and you get to watch a cool experience? Like yeah, and your car... Buffets around like it's Whoa, a 4D experience. Like and so our friend Christopher in France made a thing. Take it away, Christopher. Hello, Zach and Jesse. This is Christopher from France. So during this time we are stuck inside, I invented a little system to hold your cable tidy. And as I think it could be useful to other people, I put it on Kickstarter. So you can have a look uh, at Kickstarter. It's called Charge Hang. Bye. And you can support him on Kickstarter. He's actually making it. I need that thing because he's right. My cable is always in the dirt. Right. People That's are awesome. Walking on it, running it over. And he's making it out of stainless steel, which I admire. Thank you. All right, it's time for our on-air question of the week. And if you'd like to be able to submit a question, join us on Patreon at the $4 or above level, and we might be reading your question. All right, so Jim says, does it make more sense for Tesla to provide sell and pack production capacity to up-and-coming EV companies like Arkimoto, or would it be better to buy Arkimoto and more quickly scale up their production? This is a good question. I think that Tesla should be focusing on batteries um, just because it takes a lot of brain power to scale up production. Uh, successfully, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think that Arkimoto is interested in possibly working with Tesla as a supplier of batteries because right. we never think of them as that way, like a supplier of batteries from Tesla. But yeah, if they're going to make all these batteries and they want to transition more cars to sustainable, why wouldn't they sell them to a company like Arkimoto? Yeah, perfect. All right, we asked this poll question: Do you think Elon would seriously relocate Tesla headquarters to Nevada or Texas? And the majority of people thought that he would do it. Yeah. Wow. Right. I was, yeah, I was thinking that, like, maybe that was just a bluff. Uh, I'm hoping it's a bluff. I think, but... it's a, I think it's a bluff. And I want to remind you, if you want to become a patron and answer our weekly polls, you can uh, join us on Patreon. All right, it's time for our Supercharger Reviews, sponsored by our friends at Evanex, the Tesla community's accessory store. If you're looking for awesome accessories for your Tesla, check out Evanex and use our discount code, now you know, to save you 10% on purchases over $100. 
12 new superchargers at the Galita site next to Costco, Home Depot. Lots and lots of food court around here. Not quite open yet, but probably soon. Hi, I'm Holly. And I'm John. And we are currently at the 8 stall supercharging station in, Grims in Grimsby, Ontario. Lots of amenities in this area. We're in the same parking lot as Casablanca Inn. There's another inn down the road, Motel 8. And um, lots of food. There's a Harvey's across the road, Swiss Chalet, Subway. Um, there's a corner store. And there's also Tim Hortons. Being Canadian, got to have Tim Hortons. Uh, we're only about a five minute walk away from Lake Ontario. So certainly picturesque. And um, yeah, it's a great location for a supercharger. So what would you rate this one? I would rate this one a nine. I think a nine is about right. So Grimsby Supercharging Station, nine out of 10. Now you know. Thanks. Hey, Zach and Jesse, this is Justin. I'm in Grove City, Pennsylvania at a Tesla Supercharger. Uh, it's located here uh, in Grove City, Prime Outlet Malls. Across the road, there's some uh, Primanti Brothers to eat at, Eaton Park, uh, places to go shopping. There's easily 100 stores to go to in the outlet mall, plus a food court. Uh, this particular supercharger has six stalls. Uh, it's situated at a sheets. So you can uh, use restrooms here and also go into the uh, food center and get an MTO and whatever you want. Uh, based on this location, I'd give it an eight out of eight, uh, especially if you want to do shopping, it might go to a nine. So if you're here for a long term, you can go across the road and go shopping after a supercharge. And now you know. I'm at the Peppermill Resort Hotel and Casino in Reno, Nevada. Yes, the Atlantis Supercharger is just less than a mile up the road, but Peppermill has a couple of destination chargers which are definitely worth knowing about. They are located just in front of the check-in area. There's the valet. Just beyond that covered area is the hotel registration. And right here are the two chargers. They are pumping out electrons at 80 amps, 240 volts. So you're getting quite a charge from these two. I come from San Francisco over the hill and by the time I get here, even after charging up on the way, I have a pretty low state of charge. But thanks to this destination charger, I'm able to charge up without having to run over to the Atlantis for the supercharger. So it's very convenient. And of course, Peppermill will allow you to come in, play some games here, and charge up. Give this a very high rating of a 10 out of 10 for a destination charger. Well, thank you for going out there in the world and doing your part to help people understand what's out there for destination and superchargers. Uh, if you haven't been out there, it's still safe to go out and, you know, rub, wash off the supercharger first and then wash your hands. Uh, pretty or safe just activity. just seal yourself in your car. Use some tape if you want to. I and mean, then how would the how would they plug in the charger? You don't have to. Just take just, a picture oh, just of sit, it. Oh, okay. You can yeah. just sit in the parking lot and say, I think this is a good charger. <laughs> I don't know if it's working, but it is a charger and it exists. All right, it's time for new superchargers. What do we got this week? We have the 8-stall 250-kilowatt supercharger in Gilman, Illinois. And number 814 in the USA, number 1856 in the world, is the 12-stall 250-kilowatt in Goleta, California. All right, it's time for the giveaway. And this week, we're going to be giving away a Poster Envy poster. So if you'd like to get into our big barrel of fun, and here's the poster you could win then uh, you're going to want to join us on Patreon. And the more you support us, the more times we put you in the barrel of fun. And who's our winner this week, Jesse? The winner this week. And by the way, you're not going to Mars. You're just getting a poster of Mars. Oh, okay. Sorry. Although the winner is Robert Burnham. Robert, congratulations. You won yourself a Poster Envy poster. And you made it to the end of the show. Thank you so much for joining us. And... I'm just so excited about this electric performance channel race car. Yeah. It's a race car now because it looks like a race car. And I think that that is the biggest, most importantest thing is that we have we have an actual race car. It is funny how when it got its wrap, 
it started to look and feel different. Like I know it's still the same car underneath, but right. now you know you're just programmed to think a race car looks a certain way, and it's about to get some more things on it, which Blake is. There's be a lot of fun stuff, and, and it's got the names on it. Right. So you should definitely head over to Electric Performance Channel over on YouTube. You can also get your name on the car that is going to be going up Pikes Peak. If it makes it to the top of Pikes Peak, it will be the fastest Model Three to go up Pikes Peak. So you can get yeah. your name on that car. That's you can history. head over to electricperformance.tv um, to get your name on the car. We have opened it back up to about, eh, we're running out of names already. Right. Uh, less, uh, I think we're up to what, 47 names left. I think so. So there are 47 more slots left on this car. It's so exciting. It and and the best part is, is that it is completely community sponsored. Yeah. We got the car donated from a viewer. Yep. Thank you, Dave. We got the car wrapped by a viewer thank you shane um and all to all the people who put their names on this car thank you because you are going to make it possible to make history with this car and i'm just so excited about it and if you know anything about roll cages or welding and you want to help us to get the roll cage in the car and you live in the florida area somewhere near blake where we can get this done we would love for you to fill out our google form down below because we need your help there's still more to be done to the car to get it ready for pike's peak which is uh what just about three months away right this is so exciting. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Make sure you subscribe and like the channel. And uh, we'll see you next week. And don't forget, Friday, we're going to be talking all about Battery Day.